Hi, welcome to this Controller's Corner special report on the economic development projects that are reshaping the city of Buffalo. We're going to be taking you to the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus and the solar panel manufacturing facility at Riverbend in just a few minutes. But first, let's explore the progress Buffalo has been making on developing its waterfront. And where better to do that than right here at Canal Side? Whether it's paddle boating on the historic canals in the summertime or ice skating on them in the winter, Canal Side has become a year round destination that embraces Buffalo's history as the western terminus of the Erie Canal. One of the best places to enjoy Buffalo's waterfront is on the water itself. So let's go aboard one of the tour boats of Captain Rick Hilleman. I'm aboard the Spirit of Buffalo with Captain Rick Hilleman. Now Rick, in addition to this great schooner, you're also the captain of the Buffalo River History Tours and the Queen City Bike Ferry. What can passengers expect aboard one of your boats? Well, the Queen City Bike Ferry completely blew us away with our passenger count. Originally, when we launched it, we expected about 10,000 riders going across the Buffalo, uh, the Buffalo Harbor um, for the entire season. Well, a little more than three weeks into it, we, uh, we already hit the 10,000 mark, and now we're looking at a possibility of moving uh, 50,000 people for the entire season from the inner to the outer harbor. Uh, it's been a huge success. The, uh, the Buffalo River History Tours, we started that four years ago, and uh, that's increasing uh, every day, and uh, telling the story of the city of Buffalo, what we're all about, how we began, and uh, the history of the Erie Canal, all of the grain elevators up the Buffalo River, so that's a huge success with us, uh, and we plan on having that uh, continue. The Spirit of Buffalo, uh, we started the Spirit of Buffalo, brought it up from Georgetown, South Carolina in 2009, the spring of 2009, when Canal Side was really just starting to get going. And uh, at that time, you can uh, probably shoot a uh, cannon down the boardwalk after five o'clock and not hit anybody. And, uh, and now you can see how vibrant it is down here. The City of Buffalo and Erie Canal Harbor Development Corp has, uh, has done a great job. And I think uh, we're a world-class city here, coming close to it. Now you navigate Lake Erie, Buffalo River. We're in the Erie Canal right now. The Niagara River is close by. How have these waterways forged Buffalo's history over the past two centuries? Well, it's, uh, starting off with Lake Erie, Lake Erie in the uh, early days of uh, shipping, the uh, opportunity to ship grain across the uh, Great Lakes into the Buffalo Harbor and transfer them to canal boats, that was a, uh, a huge part of uh, what we are today. And it was all about, the, uh, all about the grain industry is what started Buffalo and the Erie Canal. So the, uh, the Niagara River, of course, the, uh, the power plant uh, that, uh, that we have uh, down in Niagara Falls, this is all uh, huge to Buffalo. Uh, we were the first city in the, uh, in the United States to have street lights. So uh, that was pretty exciting for us, and that was all due to Niagara Falls. The, uh, the Buffalo River just shaped our, uh, shaped our, uh, our history and our future uh, with the grain industry becoming the largest grain port in the world at one time. So, all of these waterways uh, that are right next to us just shape the city the way it is today. Now, in addition to Canal Side, we're seeing other pop parks popping up on the shores of Lake Erie and the Outer Harbor and in the Buffalo River. Is Buffalo regaining its status as a waterfront city? Oh, absolutely. I believe that um, wholeheartedly. The, uh, every year that we've been here, we see something new coming along. You know, as, as you mentioned, the parks, you know, Wilkeson Point and uh, the rest of the parks in the Outer Harbor. <clears throat> we have, um, we have River, River Fest Park and uh, uh, all of the other things that are happening up here along the Buffalo River. We're seeing developments now up the Buffalo River, such as River Works and, uh, and uh, River Fest Park, the new building that's going up there as a banquet hall, a hot dog stand, and just many things going on. The, uh, the Erie Freight House, for example, uh, that's all being redeveloped now to townhouses, so we're looking forward to it. I see things coming almost uh, every day. Now, Rick, you were one of the first businesses to locate here at Canal Side. You mentioned how the crowds have really increased since uh, you first started. How else has it changed since you got your start here in 2009? Well, besides the crowds coming in, what we notice mostly is we, we start seeing people on our vessels from, uh, from all over the world. I mean, we have like uh, just different cultures coming in, people we've never seen before. Huge groups from, uh, from China, for example, uh, 
a, a lot of uh, groups that we entertain on the Buffalo River telling our side of the story here. Also Toronto, we, uh, Toronto, Montreal. Last night we had a group of people from Montreal taking, uh, taking a ride on the Spirit of Buffalo. And uh, <clears throat> talked to one couple, it was uh, really exciting. They had a three day vacation, they had a babysitter for three days. So uh, out of all the places they could pick, they lived in Montreal, they picked Buffalo to come and spend their three days. So. That's great. Now we're seeing Canal Side spur private development, including the $200 million Harbor Center project that the Buffalo Sabres built, and they just hosted the NHL Scouting Combine last week. What else do you envision for the future of Canal Side, and what do you see coming to it in the years ahead? I think in the private sector, what I see is I see more retail space, um, shops, uh, shops and more restaurants uh, downtown in the downtown area, Canal Side area. Uh, that's what I envision. Um, you know, when we look at uh, other cities such as Baltimore and places like that in Boston, um, I think that's going to play a big part of uh, retaining the, uh, the people that are coming in to visit Buffalo as a destination. So I think a few more of those type of things from the private sector I think is going to help us. Well, thanks for joining us in Controller's Corner, and thanks for your contributions to Buffalo's waterfront. We've seen where Buffalo likes to play. Now let's look at where it goes to work. I'm here at the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, where a new children's hospital and the University at Buffalo's new medical school are currently under construction. Once complete, these projects will join Roswell Park Cancer Institute and Buffalo General Hospital as the main anchors of the campus, and they'll employ more than 17,000 people. But the goal of putting all these entities into one place is to foster the collaboration and innovation that will lead to new startup companies. And the plan is working. More than 140 new companies have started here at the campus, feeding off the synergy and brain power located here. Helping these startups succeed is the goal of Pat Whalen, a one-time entrepreneur who's now the chief operating officer of the medical campus. Pat, you work out of the Innovation Center. How does that building help young businesses start up and succeed? Well, I believe that entrepreneurs need a support system, and that's first and foremost what we try to do in that building. Uh, we're a little different than a lot of incubators because uh, most incubators assign mentors. What I believe in and what we believe in on the medical campus is that the, mentor, the mentorship comes from peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer mentoring. So we we'll designed the building in such a way as we designed the rest of the campus, really, uh, so that entrepreneurs bump into each other. We call them purposeful collisions. We try to have them bump into each other, and where they bump into each other, they can sit down. There's a whiteboard usually, and they can sketch their ideas out, and uh, two entrepreneurs may talk to each other and get an idea for another business. But uh, to support the businesses they already have, I think it's all about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. So if the medical campus were a hospital, the Innovation Center would be the neonatal unit helping these young businesses start up. Right, yeah, and they need help. Uh, entrepreneurs need help. Everybody talks about money, of course. You need money, but it really starts before you need money. You need, you need a business plan. You need to build a team. You need, you need a lot of things, uh, actually, before you need money. And what we try to do is get them ready to ask for the money intelligently. And there's been over 140 companies that have already started here at the Innovation Center. Uh, on the campus, uh, not all of them at the Innovation Center, most of them, I think there's 100 companies in the building now. Uh, there's a lot more that are uh, germinating really in DIG, which is uh, our pre-incubation space. Uh, but there's about 140 uh, startup companies on the campus and really that's happened in five years uh, since we opened the Innovation Center. At the time there were three companies on the campus, so yeah, 140 companies from three is a pretty, pretty good success in five years. Now the Innovation Center and the campus as a whole is designed to foster these purposeful collisions. How is the rest of the campus designed to foster this kind of collaboration? Well, we're standing in Ellicott Park. So the city of Buffalo, uh, uh, Matt Ensis, really my boss, uh, way before I was here, uh, realized that the, the idea was all about purposeful collisions and collaboration. Uh, he went and campaigned uh, in Washington, got the federal government to, to uh, come up with some money to, to, to uh, develop this park here. Uh, that money flowed through the state DOT and the city of Buffalo. And the city of Buffalo's T 
team designed this park with us. And uh, as you can see, the, the park is designed in such a way that it gets, hopefully, gets people out of these buildings on the campus walking and where they pass each other, there's benches in the park. And since we can't put whiteboards in the park, we're deploying sidewalk chalk so that the entrepreneurs or researchers can sketch out their ideas on the sidewalk, take a picture of it with their phone and, and uh, use that instead of a whiteboard. Buffalo controller Mark Schroeder recently took analysts from Fitch Ratings on a tour of Buffalo, and you led the part of the tour that dealt with the medical campus. What did you show these analysts? Well, we started where the research happens, because uh, obviously the entrepreneurs are important, but I think that's the end game. Uh, obviously, the member institutions have other goals. Uh, Collida and Roswell are interested in great outcomes in clinical care. University of Buffalo is interested in research. Roswell is interested in research. Uh, University of Buffalo is interested in education. Uh, but out of that, all those people now that are, are reaching critical mass with all those people on the campus, that results in ideas and what we're trying to do at the innovation center is, is germinate those ideas in the companies so what we did on the on the tour is we started where the research happens and the education happens and the clinical care happens because without that without collider roswell ub and our other uh, member institutions we really don't have uh, the innovations we don't have a need for the innovation center because the innovation is really coming from the researchers and the member institutions so what i tried to do on the tour was show the finch people the whole gamut. It starts with starts at the other end of the campus with research and education and clinical care, and then it works up its way up here to where we where we try to commercialize that research. Now, have any businesses outgrown the Innovation Center and branched out into the community? Yes, we've had uh, uh, a couple of graduates from our incubator in the Innovation Center. And uh, it's interesting that a lot of times they outgrow the, the incubator and they want to stay. Uh, but if they're not in the life science space, uh, our job is really to grow those businesses and, and get them out to the private sector. So uh, we've had some grow, outgrow the incubator in the, in the innovation center and move down in the innovation center. So right across the street is uh, Mobile Healthcare Connections. They were our first tenant and uh, they occupy about 8,000 square feet of space on the first floor. They're in the life science business and they needed access to the clinicians and the research that happens on the campus, so they're still on the campus. But generally speaking, we're trying to grow the companies and get them out of here in the, in the private sector uh, with the private sector landlords and real estate developers. Now you mentioned DIG, the pre-incubator project. What does DIG stand for and is it just for medical companies or any type of entrepreneur? It stands for Design Innovation Garage. It's actually in the space that used to be the Trico Test Garages, where they tested windshield wipers. It is not for only uh, life science companies. In fact, in, in the Innovation Center, we have DIG, which is pre-incubation space. We have accelerators, two accelerators, uh, 43 North and Z80, and we have an incubator. And those four operations really are, are not just for life science companies. When you graduate and you need to sign a lease, and your, your post-incubation, then that's when we, we, we don't want uh, non-life science companies to stay here. We only want the life science companies to stay here. But we're trying to incubate all kinds of companies, and I think it's, that's, that's a very important point because our estimation is, and there's a lot of research on this, that shows the more eclectic, the more diverse the, the group of people you have, the more innovation you get. So we're, really, we're actually trying to get all different kinds of companies in the pre-incubation space and the acceleration space and the incubation space because the more diverse that group is, the more uh, innovation we get. Now, the Innovation Center has been so successful, you're looking at plans to expand the Innovation Center and possibly do other Innovation Centers on the campus, correct? Correct. We, we're, we talk a lot about Innovation Center, too. We've been working on that for quite a while. Uh, this building is full. We have developed two other uh, um, spaces on the campus. Uh, we call Innovation Center Annex uh, at Maine and Virginia. And we have a, a life science incubator at 73 High Street, the old Hauptman Woodward building. Uh, but all of it's full. We're all full. The, all, the, all the real estate we've developed for early stage companies is now full. So obviously there's a need. Uh, for more space. So that's that's the reason we're working on Innovation Center 2. I'm not sure uh, what Innovation Center 2, what, what would that form would be. It could be for more mature companies and we still do all the incubation uh, here at the Innovation Center. I guess we still need to work some of those details out, but there's definitely, definitely a very definite need for more space on the campus for private sector companies. 
Now, 140 companies is an awfully good start to, for startups. What is a goal that you think is realistic in 10, 20 years from now for campus, uh, companies starting up at the campus? Uh, I wouldn't even want to guess. Uh, okay. If you would have, if I would have guessed, uh, if you would ask me this question five years ago, I don't think I would have guessed at 140. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done better than I would have ever imagined. And we've done it really without being a critical mass. We are, we're not a critical mass today, but when the med school is completed here in 2017, when the children's hospital is here in 2017, I believe we'll be a critical mass. We'll have another 5,500 people on the campus, bringing the total to 17 or 18,000 people. And that's an awful lot of brain power here that's, that, that we hopefully will have purposeful collisions between those people. They'll come up with ideas. Those ideas will become companies. and. I, the sky's the limit. We could, we could, if we've done 140 companies without critical mass, uh, I think we could do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies uh, here on the campus. Now, keep in mind, the last five years have been pretty good five years economically for for the United States in general. Uh, so I don't want to, uh, we don't want to get too big ahead here. We've had, we've had a started in 2008 when the economy was bottomed out, and it's been five good years. So. Uh, we haven't had a lot of failures in the new companies, and that's that's unusual, and I don't think we can expect that kind of success indefinitely. At some point in time, there's gonna be a hiccup in the economy, and we're gonna have failures uh, more than we've had, but we've been very lucky and fortunate so far. We've got great entrepreneurs, and they get great coaching here, so I think, I think uh, we've laid a good, solid foundation. Now, you mentioned the medical school and the children's hospital being finished. What else is on the horizon for the campus, and where do you see it down the line? Well, I think uh, the big, the big advances on the campus in terms of real estate development probably um, centered around the University of Buffalo. I think uh, I think they would like to move uh, four more units down here. I think they'd like to see someday pharmacy. That's probably the last one, but dentistry, public health, nursing. I can't speak for the University of Buffalo though. Uh, I think that, but I think those would be big, big additions. And then obviously the private sector companies. We have a, you know, just read that Empire Genomics is looking for a newer facility and they're raising $14 million. Uh, Kinex is, is doing well. So we're going to have more of those successes and those successes are going to drive uh, more development of buildings. Innovation Center 2 would be a good example. We need, to, we need to find space for these companies. We don't want them to leave. So that's a really important thing for Buffalo, I think. The growth of the medical campus is part of Buffalo's shift towards science and technology and away from the heavy industry that once dominated its economy. Nowhere is that shift more evident than right here. Once a sprawling steel plant, this site lay dormant for decades after the plant closed. Now under construction is Buffalo Riverbend, which will be the largest solar panel manufacturing facility in the Western Hemisphere. At 1.2 million square feet, this $6 billion project will create 3,000 permanent jobs. I'm speaking with Frank Simonelli, Vice President of General Contractor LP Simonelli, on the scale of this massive project. Now Frank, what are the unique challenges of a project of this scale, especially one on such an accelerated timeline? Well, you hit the first one right on the head. It's the pace at which we're delivering this massive project, 1.2 million square feet in about in a little less than 18 months. Uh, beyond the, the, the sheer magnitude of the job and the speed, we have the uh, unusual nature of this being a brownfield reclaimed um, you know, steel fact factory and the surprises we, we find in the, in the ground, uh, coupled with you know, what I refer to as the speed of what industry wants and the fiduciary responsibility with state funds, that, you know, that yin and yang uh, is also you know, put some challenges on the staff. Now this plant will create 3,000 permanent jobs once it's open. How many construction jobs are resulting from this project? Right now there are about 450 tradespeople on site, plus the about 50 people in the trail in our uh, trailer complex. Uh, at full peak we expect somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 tradespeople to be on site. Now can you put into perspective just the size of this project and a better understanding of what it compares to? Well it's, it's 1.2 million square feet under roof. So to put that in perspective for somebody that really doesn't appreciate the magnitude of it, that's approximately eight uh, um, Walmarts under, uh, under a single roof. Now this was a former steel plant. What kind of evidence have you found of its previous use? Well, I jokingly say that every shovel's a new adventure out here because um, 
the process of uh, decommissioning a steel plant doesn't require them to pull out of this, anything that was underground out, out of the ground. So the, the sheer mass of this plant, you know, the, the structures were everywhere. And so we uh, encounter old steel foundations, some scrap steel, building components, all kind of buried right under the ground. So we, we plan everything underground as if we're going to hit something. So we have a lot of pre-excavation, pre-drilling, so that we're doing everything um, in preparation for the actual work so that by the time the tradesmen that actually need to do the work come through here, they're, they're, they're working through virgin soil. We've already cleared the other stuff out of the way. Now, you mentioned a steel turbine that even your heaviest equipment had trouble lifting out. Yeah, the, uh, the, the excavators in the backgrounds are the, are the little ones. The big ones are gone now, but it took uh, quite, a, quite an effort just to scratch some of them out of the ground. Now this project includes a five billion dollar investment by Solar City, which is led by international business magnate Elon Musk. What makes Buffalo attractive to investors of his caliber? Well, I think what, not to speak for him, but from what, from my understanding, obviously the state's investment was a big piece of that. Uh, not to mention the uh, the local infrastructure, our, our proximity to major cities for transportation, and obviously skilled workforce. Uh, you know, is uh, other th shots in the arm. Now this site is nestled in between several neighborhoods, uh, residential neighborhoods. What, an, what impact will this project have on those neighborhoods and as the economy as a whole? Well, we've already heard about um, some investment coming just down South Park for some of the um, support retail uh, restaurants already getting prepared for ultimately the 1,400 uh, employees that uh, will work at this plant. That, that hasn't been, you know, that's, uh, this plant's been dormant for 20 years. So obviously what the neighborhoods that used to support this facility uh, will, be, will be the initial benefactors uh, of, of that, that new use. Now we mentioned this accelerated timeline. When did you get started here and when are you going to finish up? Well, we, uh, we, I think groundbreaking was September 18th, and uh, that we started scratching out the, build, the initial building foot uh, based on the initial concept plans, and we went through a process where we were designing and constructing kind of in a just-in-time manufacturing type process. Where, uh, so we started in September, we, uh, we were pouring foundations through the winter, we started uh, steel erection in mid-February. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're nearing topping out and uh, we'll be enclosed before weather turns on us uh, and as it, as it plans right now we'll, we'll be receiving tools towards the end of this year beginning of next and we'll, they'll be receiving the manufacturing tools through the first and second quarter and then they do their commissioning processing kind of testing out before the plant comes into full production. Yeah. Now that's quite an ambitious schedule for a project of this scale. Have you guys been working around the clock and in inclement weather to get this project done on time? Well, everybody knows how bad our winter in uh, particular February was. So we, we right now, we're right on schedule uh, despite what Mother Nature did to us. So yeah, we did have, we lost about a week just uncovering from the snow in November and another couple of weeks just because of the cold weather in, in February. But ultimately, just from um, proactive planning and some long uh, six and seven day weeks, we've uh, been able to maintain the uh, desired outcome at, uh, with, the, with the delivery date. Great, thanks for joining us. Thank you. After struggling to adapt to economic conditions of the 20th century, Buffalo has rebounded in the new millennium. Realizing there were no silver bullets or quick fixes to the challenges it faced, Buffalo has adopted a multifaceted strategy to cultivating a more modern, sustainable economy. A new day has dawned in the city of good neighbors, one filled with optimism and enthusiasm for the future of Buffalo and its citizens. For Controller's Corner, I'm Pat Curry at City Hall.